And so he said to me, okay, if uh, if you like, you can come back in six months' time if you've achieved the title mm-hmm. and uh, rejoin the company. And I, I think sort of in hindsight, I kind of wish he did, didn't make me that offer because then what happened is I actually made the title within the six months and ended up going back to the company. <laughs> and we <laughs> probably... <laughs> We're here again, meet the Fritz trainer, this time with one uh, Fritz trainer, which has made loads of Fritz trainers so far. Nick Pert, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a, it's a great honor to talk with you because you've been one of the most active Fritz trainers um, of all our Fritz trainers. Just in case people uh, really don't know who you are yet, Give us a little uh, summary of who you are, um, what you have done, and how you came to play chess after all. Okay, so um, I'm a chess grandmaster from from England, and I started playing chess when I was very young, five years old. I've got a twin twin brother, uh, Richard, and um, we went on a skiing holiday when we were young with my parents, and uh, there wasn't any snow, which was a bit of a blow, and so my dad decided to teach us chess. And oh, yeah, <laughs> that's how it started. So otherwise, you bo- otherwise, both of you would have been um, ski slalom pros now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I'm not sure if we're good enough skiers for that, but uh, <laughs> something different might have happened. So we played and um, obviously having a twin brother, um, I don't know if anyone knows about twins, we're quite competitive. So we like to try and beat each other from a young age. And uh, we were quite fortunate because there was a chess trainer that actually lived on the same road as us. Uh, Kevin O'Connell and he he started giving us chess lessons from quite a young age because I think we played a, a junior tournament in the local area we grew up in Ipswich and uh, I think we came first equal in the tournament and he saw that and off the back of that he started giving us lessons and uh, yeah it kind of just developed from there really excellent and um, nice. I think uh, yeah my breakthrough year was probably when I was 12 years old and I won the, I used to play a lot of the local league competitions and the, the adults in the league were about, actually I think they're about 180 grade, I guess they're about 2,100 level, this sort of level. And there were three main competitions at the time. There was the Ipswich Club Championship, I think the Suffolk Open Championship and the Suffolk Close Championship. And they had all these players in around 170, 180 level. And I won all three of those tournaments when I was 12 years old against the adults. And that was probably the year where I suddenly um, accelerated a bit and uh, my sort of chess level went up. And I actually got the bronze medal in the European Under-12 Championship that year as well. So it was kind of a good year. But uh, then probably I didn't do so much chess uh, for a while after that because I went to boarding school. And although there was a little bit of chess involved at the school, um it i guess it wasn't really the main focus of the school so you might do uh, we had a chess teacher there graham knee i think we had one hour a week with him but that was more or less all the chess we we did at school mm-hmm. whereas nowadays i think people probably do a lot more um, at the young age, young age groups um but no it was it was good and then i just played um, tournaments during the holidays and um i think um i used to play the the sort of uh the junior tournaments, the World and European Youth Championships, I normally played one of those each year. Um, and obviously just the British Championships, Hastings. Um, they had a Smith & Williamson Young Masters tournament. Uh, so I used to play that each year and uh, yeah, mm. built up a circle of friends and just got into it that way. So it was good. That's a good motivation, I guess, if you win a lot of those uh, um, early or young age uh, games like under 12 and against all the players. Now, um, coming back to the Fritz trainers, as far as I counted, and I think I counted correctly, you have made uh, 13 Fritz trainers so far. Um, how did that happen? <laughs> Why so many? <laughs> I don't know. I just I started off, um, I'm not quite sure how I got into it, actually. I remember going over one, uh, one time when I did, I did my first uh, uh, video series um, on the French and the Slav. And I put a lot of effort into them. I think the French one in particular just took me ages to um, research all of the all of the opening ideas. And it was a, it was an opening that I played uh, exclusively, actually all the way up till I think maybe up to the Grandmaster title was the only opening I used to play against E4. And probably only more recently I've branched out into other openings as well. 
and uh, that's I think necessary nowadays because of all the preparation that's involved but when I was growing up there, there wasn't so much uh, need to play lots of different openings because yeah the databases weren't so good and <laughs> it wasn't so easy for players to, to to kind of flip through your games and see what you're doing so yeah I, I relied on the French a lot and um, yeah I think that was that was quite a successful um, video series and off the back of that yeah. then I ended up producing I tried to come every year and do a couple more and you know, add to the ones I've already done Nice. Yeah, you even um, so. So the latest one is the Black Repertoire versus the Anti Sicilians, which is uh, very nice, very helpful for me. My gosh, I I lost my match against the Sicilian uh, again on a terribly <laughs> bad way. <laughs> so um, I, I wish I sh uh, would have looked at it a bit earlier. But nonetheless, uh, I also enjoyed a lot the the typical mistakes that the club players are doing. I mean it be 1600 to 1900 or 1800 to 2000 that was actually uh, very interesting because i could identify myself with committing to uh, too much to certain moves and stuff like this how did you uh, come up with this idea i, I think we're just trying to find a new idea that wasn't opening space because mm. obviously everything is um, you know opening base nowadays and people are also interested in, in having you know, other, improving other areas of their game. So came up with this idea of typical mistakes, which I think was fairly unique at the time. Yeah. We spoke to um, Pascal at Chessbase about it and we decided to give it a go. And it seemed to be um, sort of fairly well received. So uh, ended up producing three, um, three of the uh, typical mistakes uh, video series uh, for different rating ranges. But the idea of them is to just um, take uh, uh, basically to look through games of players of, of the selected rating range and try to find common themes, common um, areas where they're going wrong, and then put them into chapters and have example games and give interactive um, ideas for, for the viewer to try themselves in order to try to avoid making those mistakes. And hopefully, um, that's something which is quite useful for for people to to learn from. Um, yeah, as for the anti Sicilian one. That, that was, uh, I think, quite a good, um, uh, it's quite good to have that along with a mainline Sicilian mm. uh, video series or DVD because that way you have a complete repertoire against E4. And um, I had just produced one video series on the Kalashnikov. So if you have the Kalashnikov and anti-Sicilian, then that's a complete repertoire against E4. I think um, other um, authors have done, for example, the Sveshnikov, which... Uh, Magnus Carlsen has been playing quite a lot recently. So if uh, someone bought the Sveshnikov DVD and an anti-Sicilian DVD, they'd have a full repertoire. So that was the idea of it, that it would complement these mainline Sicilian uh, repertoires, but uh, it was based on the move order with two light C6. So not yeah. all anti-Sicilians, but just a full repertoire if, you, if you're if you playing light C6 or move two in the Sicilian. Yes, and you've you've mentioned some uh, other Fritz trainers too, which are going hand in hand with uh, your your DVD series, uh, series, which is very nice because you can build up your collection a bit stronger and get more variations, other ideas, and uh, good examples about that. Now, uh, two of your absolute greatest achievements were um, you mentioned this um, your IM and your GM title. How was sure. the how was the goal or how was the way to receive your IM title and then moving on even to the GM title? Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, the IM title. So to anyone who doesn't know, normally the route to to become an IM is to gain three international master norms, which is th uh, three tournament perform performances of two thousand four hundred and fifty or higher, and to um, establish a FIDE rating of two thousand four hundred. And um, I um, was playing the World Under-18 Championship, and at the time my rating was around about 2,400, but I didn't actually have any of the norms. Um, so I think that I was just a fairly consistent player that was playing at this level, but not really able to um, excel and have a sort of special tournament that would uh, give me an international master norm. Um, but so it just happened that that event, I just had a really, really good tournament. I probably didn't even, really think that I was contending to win the tournament until the very last round and somehow I, I won several games against players around my rating or slightly higher mm. and uh, managed to win, win the event 
And I actually gained the international master title automatically by winning the World Under-18 Championship. Um, but it, yeah, it, it was quite funny because actually um, when I played, I was actually playing upper year group. So it wasn't even my year group. I was playing with people that are a year older. Huh. And I wasn't even due to play. I think uh, Karl Ma, who was an English player at the time, was the first choice of the selectors. And uh, normally at the time, one player plays the world's youth and one player plays the European youth and I think he chose the Europeans <laughs> and normally the first choice would choose the world so I wasn't even due to play oh. in the tournament and then I ended up winning the event so it was oh, quite a story yeah it was quite a nice uh, surprise but um, so going into the last round myself and this Russian player um, Alexei Ilyasha we both had eight out of ten hmm. and the rest of the field were, were seven out of ten or lower so the two of us were point clear of, of the rest. I think the top seed was Lenia Dominguez, Oof. who now plays a lot in America. Um, I remember I had quite a tough game against him earlier in the event. Um, and uh, my, my coach for the event actually was um, Stuart Conquest. And it was actually, he was quite a good person for me because I didn't have probably uh, a very broad opening repertoire going into the event. And he's one of these players that was able to come up with a lot of kind of, I don't know what they you know, just p pull an opening idea out of the hat, learn it in, in a couple of hours type of person, you know, not, not necessarily like mainstream. And that actually worked really well for me. So um, I was able to play some of these openings, just learn them in the morning and then and then play them. Wow. And uh, actually before the tournament, in the British Championship before the tournament, in the last round, I actually won a game against Stuart, which is quite nice. <laughs> 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 he was my coach, but it, it was just uh, one of those things. Now um, I am your master. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, he was re really good uh, for me because he was quite laid back and <laughs> kind of make you feel like relaxed and oh, that's nice. oh don't worry about it just play this 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 it'll be fine <laughs> and somehow they got me through and anyway going into the last round um, it was a morning game and uh, they'd worked out that my tie break was was superior to uh, my opponents mm -hmm. so if I drew the last round I was going to be the champion. And I, I was black, and we knew he played D4. And the only opening I had against D4 was actually the classical Dutch at the time. Uh -huh. And because it was an earlier start, I didn't really have time to learn um, another opening. So I was going into this game needing a draw, playing like one of the riskiest openings you can against D4. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, this probably isn't like the best, uh, the best technique possible. I've actually made a Dutch um, um, fritz trainer as well, actually now. So it is quite oh. quite an exciting opening, but. Um, I think my position was a bit suspicious at one stage, put it that way. But fortunately, um, I managed to get back into the game and uh, it, it ends up being a draw. So I, I came first on tie break. So that was quite a nice result for me. Nice. But um, yeah, it was, a, it was a bit of a surprising result because, as I said before, I hadn't had any sort of really special tournaments leading up to the event. But mm -hmm. I think sometimes you just get on a roll, don't you? And it just kind of happens for you. So that was... Um, yeah, it was a nice surprise. And obviously, again, the IM title much more easily than, than the GM title. <laughs> Put it that way. It just came straight away. So it was, it was good. Now, this was the I, um, EM? IM? IM I title. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still uh, switching from the German to, to the English sometimes. <laughs> this was the IM title. And you uh, had even a greater achievement, of course, which is the Grandmaster title. Uh, how did that go? <laughs> Uh, that that was a bigger challenge. It was actually the, the opposite way around with the Grandmaster title to the International Master title in that I managed to achieve all my norms quite early. So by 2001, I had um, all three Grandmaster norms, uh, mm. but I hadn't achieved the rating of 2,500. So this was, this was my goal to try to get my ELO up to 2,500 in order to obviously gain the title. Mm -hmm. And um, I went through um, university and um, uh, at the end of university, I did a, a maths and statistics degree. Oh. I then went on to get a real job, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, when, when I went to, to start this job, my rating was about 2,480. So I was sort of on the brink of becoming a grandmaster, but obviously I hadn't actually made it at that stage. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think just at some point I decided look, I want, to, I want to give this a go. I'd like to try and uh, achieve the title before committing to, you know, the world of work, put it that way, um, because otherwise there's a risk that I might never, I ne might never achieve this. Good so thought. I was about, I was, yeah, I don't know, I don't know whether it was the right thing or not, but about um, nine months into my job, I went up to my boss at the time 
and I said, look, you know, I'm, I'm quite keen to get this grandmaster title. So, you know, you know I, I can't do that and mm-hmm. do the job at the same time because there's only you know, four weeks a year holiday or whatever you get. It's, it's just not possible. So I, I basically went there with the intention of uh, resigning. Anyway, he, he, he spoke to me and he actually said to me, OK, uh, if you want to get this, this title, how long do you think it's going to take you? I, I said, well, I might be able to do it in six months if I have a good run. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. And so he said to me, OK, if uh, if you like, you can come back in six months time if you've achieved the title mm-hmm. and uh, rejoin the company. And I, I think sort of in hindsight, I kind of wish he did, didn't make me that offer because then what happened is I actually made the title within the six months and ended up going back to the company. <laughs> and that probably, that probably like hindered my uh, progress. Uh, my biggest problem with that if he hadn't made me the offer at the time. But oh. Anyway, that's, that's, that's hindsight for you. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, I think at the time that there were probably less opportunities for title players to earn a living through chess than there are nowadays. Of course. So now it's a lot easier with the internet and uh, a lot of people doing commentary or DVDs or, you know, whatever else they're doing. So um, um, coaching obviously is, is big as well. Um, but uh, yeah, back in back in those days, it was probably a little bit harder to generate the same kind of income just because you're a grandmaster. So I ended up um, going back to this job and, and I ended up staying in the kind of working world for probably about hey, 10 years after that. You've done the right thing. Come on. Don't, <laughs> don't feel bad about that. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. I ended up coming back to chess, so that's the way it goes. But um, anyway, so I had this um, six-month period and, you, you know, I had to try to get the title. So the first thing I did was I just started looking for any kind of events that uh, I could play in, obviously, within the you know, within that time period and just trying to play as many events as possible to give myself a chance to get my rating up. Um, I talked to, uh, you know, a couple of friends in the chess world, tried to see if anybody else was willing to come with me on any of these tournaments, just like anyone. <laughs> you know, I wanted to play, so that was it. That was my main motivation. And I was, you know, I didn't have any sort of responsibilities at the time, so I just was very, very keen to just, uh, you, you know, just achieve this goal. It was kind of what mm. my, main, my main sort of focus. And, in some ways, having having that period of time just made, made me very focused on achieving the goal within that period because, you know, otherwise if I get to the end of six months and I wasn't a grandmaster, then I'm in a difficult position. You go back to the work and you haven't achieved the title or, you know, it's, it's a lot more difficult than if I'd actually made it. So, gotcha. Um, yeah, so the first, the first one I played, I played this um, All Play All, the first Saturday All Play All in, in Budapest, Hungary. I don't know if you are aware of those tournaments. They're quite famous. Run by um, it's Naji Laszlo. He runs these GM IM all play all events um, every month. I think he's still doing them, but maybe yes. not during COVID. They, they, they've been going on for a long time. And uh, a friend of mine, not, not someone I've probably spent lots of time with, but he was uh, someone I've chatted to a few times. Lawrence Webb. He he was around, yeah. and I, I was talking to him, and he decided to come with me. So went on that, and I think his wife and his, uh, I think had a, a young child as well. They came as well. So the, f- the four of us went to Hungary, and he was playing the IM section. I was playing the GM section, and it was quite a tough event. Uh, I think the average rating was up around 2480, 2490, something like that. So for a GM normal event, it was still pretty difficult, and it was 12 rounds. And um, oh. uh, the first three games, I, I drew my first three games. And um, then after that, um, I started on this quite bad run. Where I was playing these sort of quite talented players, young young players like uh, Tronson, Kredojevic, and also experienced players like Timoshenko. And I was preparing really hard for each of the games, taking them very seriously. But just somehow or other, at key moments, they were kind of going away from me. And over the next five games, I only got a half out of five. So... I was really sort of down in the dumps oh. at this stage, thinking I've lost like 20, like I need to gain 20 points and I've lost 20 points. <laughs> it's oh, not going to plan. And I remember going back to my hotel room and I just pushed my laptop charger off the bed. I don't think it was even that hard. And somehow the charger um, broke, the laptop oh, charger God. broke. So I had a fully charged laptop. Um, but this was actually maybe that kind of turning point. So <laughs> I kind of worked out, I had about an hour, an hour's charge um, on my laptop and I had four games left. So all I was going to do was 15 minutes on each opponent, just literally enough to see what they played, and that was it. And um, <laughs> the rest of the time I was going to try and spend kind of relaxing a bit rather than the earlier rounds I've been kind of over-preparing, taking very seriously. 
And um, I actually won my last four games, which was kind of incredible. Wow. And it got, got me back to 50%. And that was real a real sort of, um, I don't know if it was co- coincidence or not, but uh, it kind of worked out well. Um, I mean, the first of the four was against uh, Victor Erdos, a Hungarian mm. player. He's, he's, I think he's a 2,600 grand master yeah. now. And uh, I remember I offered him a draw in the opening. He played some sharp line. and I was worried he'd prepared me. But then once um, I sort of survived the opening, we got to an equal position. He actually offered me a draw back. But then I, I felt like quite comfortable at that point because, okay, look, I've survived the opening. I'm fresh, <laughs> I'm fresh today. I haven't been preparing all morning. So, Not yeah, happening. That, yeah, that, <laughs> now we're going to have to play on. Yeah, so I managed to win that game. And uh, nice. yeah, and then the next three after that. And it was, um, yeah, it was a good turnaround. So, so that was that event. And then I think I played a tournament Island man. And then um, I went to, uh, I, I think I broke even on rating. And then I went to Hukugaren in Holland with uh, two good friends of mine, uh, Simon Williams and Mark Hebden. And um, yeah, they're both, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of them both. They're both uh, very well known um, chess players on the scene. Um, Simon was similar age to, to, to myself, so I mm-hmm. knew him uh, a lot from a very young age. And obviously Mark's mm-hmm. always on the chess scene. So the people that I've known for many, many years and get on very well with. Anyway, we, we were given this kind of a little, uh, like a bungalow, sort of chalet bungalow thing to stay, place to stay in. The three, the three of us stayed in this place. And uh, yeah, th- those two are qu- quite sort of uh, big drinkers, I think I put it this kind of place to stay. I hope they won't be offended when we tell us that. Because I'm, I'm not in their league by uh, any stretch of the imagination. But um, yeah, the, the first night we were playing, uh, playing some poker. We were up late, having a few drinks. Anyway, we went to sleep. Um, I got up the next the next day, uh, probably feeling a bit worse for wear. Went to have a shower, and then um, I remember Mark just say just saying, uh, "Yeah, Nick, do, do you know what time it is?" And I, I just didn't have any idea what the time was. But basically, the, the games were were just about to start, and we hadn't even realised. We had to somehow get a bus to the tournament hall, and we weren't. We didn't even. Oh, it was a nightmare just getting to the first game. So I got to the first round, and I was playing um, Peter Doggers, I think his name is, oh, and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was playing against him the first game and um, I wasn't feeling that great, but I was really, really hungry. So we played a few moves and after a few moves, I, started, I just thought I couldn't really like take it anymore. I had to go and get some food. So I went out of the tournament hall and I tried to find like a like a news agent or something, but maybe my sense <laughs> direction wasn't very good. And all I could find was like a, a pub that served, was serving meals. So um, I just sort of sat down and ordered a meal had my meal and then we yeah, went back to the game i think about half an hour later so <laughs> he's probably a bit, a bit surprised a bit surprised by that but um oh yeah then uh, luckily it was a long game it was a tough game i managed to win in the end i remember his friend came up to him at the end and congratulated him for putting up a, such a tough fight against me <laughs> if he knew the background he probably wouldn't congratulate him so much but uh yeah that was that was quite a nice uh start to the tournament but it got kind of more, yeah, more drama after that because um, the, se- the second round I won, and then the third round I played against Vlastimir Hortz. Uh, he oh probably my aware of a gosh. legend of legend of chess. I even and, played um, against him too. You played him with you. Yeah, yeah it was very, a very s- simultaneous player. match. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's an incredibly strong player. So, I, and um, I, I was black, and it was a uh, French defense again. Mm-hmm. And he played a very unusual idea in the opening uh, where he ended up bringing his king out to D2 quite early, I think about move eight or nine. Oof. And I was a bit, a bit surprised by this this plan of his, but he played it so confidently, I thought maybe it's some kind of preparation or, or something. And I, I wasn't really sure, but it looked a bit ropey to me, but he just seemed to, he seemed to be quite sort of um, okay with this idea. Anyway, I, I was spending a huge amount of time trying to exploit this king in the middle of the board. And he was also spending a lot of time. And we got to about move 30. And the position was, was roughly balanced. But both of both of us were down to about a minute each. So I think uh, time management wasn't uh, particularly good in that game, put it that way. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had to make it to move 40 to, to gain bonus time. So we started blitzing the moves out, as you can imagine. And it was really complicated, really wild. But during um, the blitz, I mean, he was just finding all the best moves. I mean, he was really... Uh, like ten- and I was playing okay, I thought. I wasn't playing badly. I was giving him some challenges. But he was just he was just repelling all of my ideas, finding all the best moves. Mm. I got to this position. My position just was, was crumbling. Um, and then the next thing, his flag fell. So um, uh, we stopped the clocks. And in my mind, we had made 40 moves. 
I thought we must have made 40 moves, but I wasn't really counting exactly. But in his mind, we'd only made 39 moves. Oh. So um, at that point, he actually resigns the game, said we hadn't made enough moves, signed the score sheet and went off. And it turned out we had made 40 moves and I was just in a completely lost position and he just resigned for no reason. So yeah, I definitely owe a sort of bottle of whiskey for that. <laughs> if I ever meet him again, I'll have to a drink. That was a real, um, <laughs> real bit of good luck for me. Oh my God. Um, yeah, I can't, uh, yeah, nice timing as well when, uh, when the rating points are so important, it was really good. I think after the game, I even offered to call it a draw if he wants to, just because I felt bad, but he apparently refused and, um, let me have the win so that was that was very kind of him indeed um, yes yes and uh yeah then i think that, at that stage i was i was on on the verge of gaining the title after that I was about six six points away and i kept playing players that are around uh 2600 and i drew i drew about three or four games against them and each time i played one of them i knew if i won that game it, it would be enough for the title uh, but if i lost obviously i'd, I'd drop back oh. and i draw yeah, a draw was gaining me sort of one one point at a time, so I was I was edging closer, but it's a obviously the, <laughs> <laughs> I was on the on the edge. But it was the win that I needed to get yeah. it, and then um, finally I played this um, uh, exciting game against Simon Dewar as a Russian grandmaster. Um, I, I, I played um, a, a very sharp uh, variation against the Grunfeld, which Simon had told me about actually in the morning. And uh, we got a kind of crazy game. It looked like it was going really well for me. I was getting excited. I was going to win. Then I blundered. And then suddenly I was worse. And then I offered him a draw. He turned it down. I was like, okay, this is a disaster. <laughs> then, uh, yeah, then, yeah, then he made a blunder back. And then I was better. And we got to some ending. I kind of hustled him a little bit in the end game and uh, managed to managed to pull it off. But on the very, very last move, I nearly made a catastrophic um, error. Um, but uh, fortunately, didn't didn't do that and uh, won that game, and that's that's the way I managed to gain the title. So it was quite oh. a tense tense match, put it that way. But uh, at the end of the game, he wasn't happy. He sort of uh, scribbled on the score sheet and just ran off. You know? oh. <laughs> he was unhappy to lose that game, but uh, to, to be fair, it was a real up and down uh, experience. But uh, that was nice to get there. And you have this game available, right? I do, yeah. I've got this game, so and I can I can show you it if you if you like Absolutely, to see. Absolutely, yes. I mean, so after much. all of this uh, roller coaster, um, yeah. that must have been an amazing feeling to to uh, know for sure that okay, that's it. I got the GM title now. It but, is. It's a big goal, isn't it? especially when you're when you've got a time limit to get it. I guess any chess player. I mean, I've seen players that have made it up to twenty four ninety nine and then come back down again. And, and never made the title so until you get it you never know for sure mm -hmm. that you're going to make it so you just want to you know want to Brutal. get that and put it for, for life and i think any chess player who's aiming for a title grandmaster or international master or whichever title it is they're going for you know that is a, a huge achievement when you, when you finally get there because it is very hard to improve with chess especially when you're playing against top players game after game and yeah um, I, I think the advice I could give to people if you are trying to, to, to chase the title is to try and do it when you're not too old, try and do it at a younger age if you can, and be pretty sort of persistent about it. Make sure you're playing strong players like all the time so that you're thinking on that high level mm. and just push yourself, play as much as possible, really. And uh, obviously, the more you can study, the better as well. There's just no quick fix. <laughs> yeah. But... Okay. You have to do it the hard way, I think. But, um, Good. Yeah, I'll, I, I, I'll take your advice. I'm still very young, <laughs> and I think I'll... <laughs> <laughs> Give it a go to Grandmaster, yeah? <laughs> but, uh, should, should, I, should I share my screen with yes, you? Yes, please. Game, if, if that's going to work. Um, okay, everything is set up. Show, okay. us, show us the game. Sure. So um, this, was, this was the game. Um, I was white. And starts off in with the Grunfeld. And uh, I normally, my main line against the uh, Grunfeld or King's Indian was always to play uh, the Fianchetto variation. But um, I knew that that was going to lead to quite solid positions. And I think at this stage, I wanted to play something a bit more aggressive and just try to try to win this game because obviously I'm white. And, you know, <laughs> you've got to try and win sometime. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be hard to actually gain the title. So I end up playing this this uh, very sharp line after takes d5, knight takes d5, e4, knight takes b takes, where you play bishop c4, 
and after C592. And uh, this is a line which I don't think I've ever repeated because it's quite heavily theoretical, um, but it's a line that Simon Williams showed me uh, before the game. And I think uh, players like Topolov have played it and some strong players have played it. And I just thought, okay, I'll give it a go because, you know, at least I get to look at it in the morning. I was pretty confident he was going to play the Grunfeld. And I just uh, uh, fancied uh, having an aggressive game. Anyway, if, um, if I just um, uh, skip through the moves a little bit. So knight c6, uh, bishop e3. He, av he avoided the lines with bishop g4, which tend to be the sharpest lines. I went for a kind of more solid uh, line with e6. So if I just uh, move on to the part where it starts getting exciting, so bishop h6, bishop b7, e5. Um, I've got a lot of control over the dark squares around his king. So I had some ideas to try to invade uh, after bishop takes g7, queen takes, queen g5. Try to invade with maybe moves such as knight g3. I like that, yeah. Knight h5, yeah, these kind of moves. Just try. I'm not quite sure exactly uh, how to do it, but lots of <laughs> um, threats on the dark squares that I might be able to create some checkmating ideas. So uh, this was the general plan. And I think that this more or less uh, forced my opponent to play f6 because if he lets my knight start hopping in around his position, it could become uh, very dangerous very quickly. Uh, so he played he played f6 in this position, and uh, I captured on f6, rook takes, and then knight g3. Mm -hmm. And I'm threatening, of course, now knight h5 check, and the pawn's pinned, and that would win the rook. Uh, so my opponent played rook, rook to f7, I played rook e1, and then he tried to chase my queen away with rook d5. And here's, I think, where I came up with um, quite a strong move. At, at this point, I was getting quite excited that I might win. Um, I found the move knight h5 check. And, and this looks, it looks a bit risky at first, because if black moves his king away, it what feels as though, point? yeah, it feels as though you could lose a piece here. Um, but uh, fortunately, I have got, I have got a resource here. I can play the move rook takes e6. Oh, and yeah, this beauty. could get really yeah, it could be could be nice. Threatening, of course, the back row checkmate. Um, so if he takes my queen, then I, then I can yes. checkmate him like this. Um, oh. And I'm just trying to think of some other. But if if he attacks my rook, this was another one of my concerns. I think I can just double rooks here yeah, and like... re renew renew the threat of rook to e8 again. So that doesn't really help him. Wow. If he plays rook here probably can play queen check i don't know if i <laughs> try to analyze on the spot i could probably play this one <laughs> um he certainly can't take it anyway he might be to play king g8 um anyway at the time i had had kind of um uh looked through what is maybe queen queen h6 was possible um i had looked through um these variations in some detail at the time and uh, theoretically it was holding up so I, I played i played this knight h5 check and after some thought he played king f8 so I thought, okay, queen, queen h6 then is the follow-up. Hmm. King e7, and again, he can't afford to allow me to take my e6. So king e7, knight g7, and then he played the move bishop c8 straight away. And uh, I, I sort of knew I knew in this position that it must be good for me because I've got, uh, well, we, we equal material. His king's now out in the, in the open, and all my pieces are quite active. Uh, I've got a chance nice. to maybe yep. win this king, king side pawns. But, it's, you know, it's one of those positions where, although there are lots of variations which are good, there's nothing which is an absolutely clean-cut kill. <laughs> and sometimes I find that they can be quite difficult positions because you just want that one line that just finishes them off. Mm -hmm. And um, I, th I think the best move when I checked afterwards was to play G3, which is quite a calm move. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's quite very calm for the position. But one of the key um, issues to deal with is after Queen takes H7, um, he's got this tricky idea of rook h5, and um, my knight's pinned. Oh. So then he starts getting some counterplay, attacking the, the h2 yeah. pawn. And I think that's probably one of the reasons behind playing g3, just so that there's no queen takes h2 check as a follow-up. And mm -hmm. then I would be able to just take that pawn on g6 and, um, uh, you know, just uh, ha have a winning position. Uh, I think the, the line which I analysed in the game was something like bishop, Bishop e4, I think was my original intention, which would have been stronger than the move that I played. I think this was my original plan, but uh, I couldn't see anything that was um, 
uh, completely clear cut in this line, although it was definitely stronger than than what I played. Uh-huh. Um, so in the game, I went for Queen H4 check, and I, I thought I was winning a pawn here after King F8, uh, Knight takes, Bishop takes, and Rook takes. I thought, okay, I'll just go into this position with this King a bit open, and I'm going to be a pawn up, and uh, I should be able to, you know, at least not not yeah. lose and, and maybe try to win. Um, but then he's got this very annoying move, uh, rook h5, and uh, after queen g3, which is necessary in order to stop uh, black from capturing on h2, he doesn't take my queen now, which would leave me a pawn up in the end game. but he can at this point play c takes d4. Yes. And this is, this is very frustrating, um, winning his pawn back. And yeah, now I think my advantage is kind of dissipated, so oh. it was... Uh, <laughs> A bit of a blow. This queen h4 move was a blunder um, that I should have tried to avoid. But um, okay, it's uh, one of those things. Um, here, I think that the best move for me would probably be queen d6 check, and we would liquidate into a, an, into an equal end game or something like this. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's supposed to be about equal. But um, yeah, in the game I played c4. I think I might offer him a draw at this stage because I was starting to get nervous. I was. It was turning against me, um, but he turned it down and played knight to b7. Um, and now I, prob- I probably have slightly worse now because his knight's coming to the strong c5 square. And uh, yeah, this I don't have really any attacking play against his against his king. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, we, we played on a few more moves and uh, rook a5, rook d1, knight c5, uh, rook e5. And he didn't probably handle this the best way, but I had a little trick which saved me in this position. So after bishop f1, he played knight to b3. And uh, his idea now is um, if I if I take the knight, obviously he can take the rook. Sure. That's his main plan. And um, if I play, for example, uh, my rook somewhere away you know, away from d2, I have to watch out for this knight d2. Mm-hmm. So he's got he's got this threat to um, to consider as well. And uh, if I move my rook back, I have to be a little bit careful, I guess, about queen takes c4 plans as well. So he's got all, all these kind of ideas in his mind, you know, all these different threats. So yeah. different threats that he's considering. Um, but, but I've got this quite nice move, queen e3, which I think he missed at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, the main plan is now he takes takes my rook. I've got the intermediate with rook e8 check. Oh, and after king g7, I take, take the knight. Check yeah, and, then take a check and then I can pick off the rook. Rook so, is hanging. <laughs> yeah, so that was quite a fortunate resource to have. Of, wow. Which is quite a nice resource to have. Um, after queen e3, he can't obviously take my rook because yeah. then he'll end up being a piece down. Uh, so in this position, he, he sacrificed uh, sacrificed the rook for the bishop. Oh. And then if he gained the exchange like this, uh, rook e8 check, king g7, and queen takes d4. And uh, yeah, I guess this position, I don't know if it's equal or if it's better for white, but uh, he he kind of panicked a little bit in this position. I think that he doesn't have to um, go into the rook and pawn ending um, material down. I think he can just um, try and hold out this kind of position with the queen and rooks on the board. Mm-hmm. But obviously, it does feel a bit more comfortable for white because black's king is... Is more exposed, so um, that's why he went for this queen c5. Um, we're both low on time. He probably didn't need to go for that because it did mean that he loses a pawn after queen takes c5, b takes, and rook c8. Now he's going to lose a pawn because I'm threatening, obviously. Yeah. Line, and I've got this rook c7 idea as well. So yes, yes. Uh, he's got to sacrifice a pawn. And um, yeah, he played rook a6. And I remember at this time, we were both low on time, and I, I knew, well, Luckily, counting moves seemed to be a strong point in, in this tournament for me and not for my opponents because um, I knew at this point we'd made 40. But I played Rook 65 instantly, kind of almost bluffing him that we hadn't made 40 moves and that this was my 40th. It was a kind of, I wanted to oh. hit one more, move, one more move. And he he was then, I could see he was looking at his clock and he was getting panicked because he wasn't sure if he made 40 moves or not. And so he felt like he had to play a move at this point. And he actually blundered at this point. And so oh, no. probably the bluff. The bluff works because he, he probably needs to play something like king f6 here and then then okay I'm, I'm better but you know he's got good drawing chances yes but uh, he ends up playing rook a2 and um oh. yeah the, the problem with this move is now i play rook check and his king um is going to be sort of consigned to quite a passive square yeah so he can't come out to f6 whereas if, if he had played it now for example 
then uh, you know his king. You don't have to check. Yeah. I don't have to check if Rooksy Seven can play H5, and his his king is at least quite well placed. Um, whereas in the game after this Rooksy Seven check, he he's got quite a difficult decision because if he goes to H6, I can play H4. H4 is, looks nasty. Yeah, this is really yeah. a horrible corner. He can't really get his king out of the corner very easily, so that's that's very unpleasant for him. And obviously, if he goes to F6, then the drawback is I can just take the H7 sure. now. So he has to really go to G8. And uh, oh. I think that that was probably the key sort of to the end game was just mm -hmm. this. Uh, inst I just instantly played it because I just thought <laughs> psychologically <laughs> very, very valuable. We <laughs> 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 poker playing on the chessboard. Yeah. Um, uh, so he played this king G8. So then we, we carried on um, C5. He played h5. He went for this interesting pawn sacrifice, uh, h4, trying to get the sort of f and h pawns. I guess he was hoping to maybe uh, reach an end game with uh, rook f and h against rook, which is technical draw or, or something mm -hmm. along those lines. It was quite a difficult um, position for him here. It is, yeah. Um, so we carried on king g3. He brought, brings his king over to try and control the c4, and a5, rook a7. Um, oh, he can't gosh. easily trade the pawns because rook c2, obviously, yes. I can play. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so maybe I should point that out actually. If he goes, uh, if we kind of go back to this position, if he plays um, a5 here, uh, rook a7, he, he'd like to swap obviously the c pawn for the a pawn, but rook c2 now doesn't work because I just of take it. Yeah. Um, and if he plays a4, then I play c6. Yeah, and yeah. now if he plays rook c2, I'm in time to exactly. play c7. Um, a3 and then yeah check and I, I queen and then obviously I, I win. So uh, his his plan of basically putting the rook behind the c pawn and then just pushing the a pawn as a as a distraction in order to trade them, it doesn't work. No. So he doesn't have this easy kind of liquidation into three v two on the king side, which uh, obviously if he could play if his king was an f six he probably could could use that plan and, and reach a three versus two. Um, because if, if his king was on f6, then he would just simply so he would just simply just keep advancing this pawn, yeah. and then take on c7 and and reach the three versus two end game. So yeah, we played on, and he, this is why he had to bring his king over to e8 before he starts advancing his a pawn. Uh, rook a7, a4, king f4. So now I decide just to activate the king and just let him have these sure. these, these h pawns. King e5, rook takes h4. Sorry, f4. Um, my king is, is very active. So rook h1 takes, king d7. Um, all the time he's tried to sort of guard uh, the c pawn. He doesn't want to let my c pawn become too dangerous. But now I just gave up the c pawn and um, went after the g pawn oh, and had this, this position. End game. Which is classical. You know, get, can get the kind of Lucina position where you have the king in front of the pawn and uh, you just check the rook away. You check the, the black king away yeah. and you've been used to building the bridge technique, which I guess you could look at Costa Muller's DVDs and <laughs> see how to do that. But uh, he played rookie one check, king e6, king f6, king d6, f5, rook f1. And now I bring my rook around to check his king away from, um, I want to actually check his king um, further towards the, the c5 yes. if possible. He goes so there, of course. Cuts, yeah. cuts, cuts him off with rookie you two. Pluck him off. Exactly. And then, and then my plan is just to play. I thought in my mind, okay, my plan is to play king here. Uh, okay, f f6. Um, then if he checks me, um, so let's say he checks me, I'll just put the king up to f7. And then the play f6. Then I'll check him one square further away. So let's say he just plays some move. I'll check him further away. I can always repeat um, repeat the same sort of yeah. pattern or something like this. And uh, then eventually um, I can, uh, let, let's say he's, he tries to stay on the G file, so I'm coming out of the G file, I guess there's various ways to win here. But I can do this um, building the bridge technique where I play rook, uh, rook here, and then I bring the king out. And uh, the rook on the fourth row is going to be a good blocker because after he keeps on uh, checking me, let's say he keeps checking me like this, for example, um, I can then block with the rook. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, then queen the pawn. So this is a general sort of idea. Um, maybe there's a slightly faster way of doing it, but this is general one of the one of the general winning plans that you can go for. Um, but yeah, so I had in my mind I'm going to play king g6, and when he checks me, play king f7, and then I went to to pick to to pick up the king, and I was about to just I just kind of got one move ahead of myself, and I was about to just put it on f7 straight away. No, which would have just allowed him to just take the pawn. Of course, and <laughs> I was like, game, oh yeah. my goodness. <laughs> 
And then just like in the last, in the last moment, just something. I think it was just like all the nerves, you know, all the nerves. Oh. know you're going to do it. And I was literally about to play King of Seven, and just thinking sort of one move ahead of myself. And, and it happens easily. I mean, much, much. Everybody, I don't know. <laughs> everybody, everybody. <laughs> probably not, not, not that often to you, but uh, it's a thing which is just happening when you're thinking at two, two moves ahead. You have this amazing plan. You've built it up all the time, and then yeah. you just make the second move before your first move. <laughs> oh, gosh. I, I think I think that only happened to me once. I think I'm playing a game against Stephen Gordon in the British Championship where I, I had this idea in my mind and I just got the move order wrong. And ended up basically. I mean, fortunately for me, didn't lose on the spot. Um, I think the game ended up being a draw, but it, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't the the idea which I had. It, it probably moved me from a slightly better position to a slightly worse position. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it can, it can happen. It doesn't happen very often, but maybe when uh, it's a sort of uh, high pressure situation, you're more likely to make mistakes. So oh, obviously, yeah, yeah. It, can, it can happen that way. But uh, yeah, and I was lucky to get there in the end, and yeah, after that. I guess that took the pressure off. Um, I've been fortunate now to play several times for England and um, yeah, plays uh, British Championships lots of times. Mm -hmm. I had come second a couple of times, um, got to the final of the British Knockout Championship one year. So had a few um, good uh, good results, but uh, yeah, the, the highlights were definitely for me winning the World Under 18 Championship and then obviously gaining the, the Grand Master title. I can imagine. Yes. Thank you for sharing this story. This was super interesting. Um, uh, I really, really uh, enjoy this, the feelings you had and the up and down and the roller coaster about all of this. <laughs> let's uh, yeah, let's get back to unshare the screen. Okay, of course. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this was uh, Nicholas Pert. Uh, we we uh, had this uh, lovely Meet the Fritz Trainer interview. We know a lot about your career, how all the things started, how you advanced to your Fritz Trainers. And um, I really hope I will see you more often in the future. Once I'm settled in Hamburg, uh, there's a lot of projects coming up. So hope uh, we can get involved with some blitzing and some VIP and other things about that. Thanks yeah, a lot. I, no, I look forward to, to coming back to Hamburg if we're able to at some point. And uh, yeah, yeah, I can meet you there for sure. All right. Thanks okay, a lot. Th Nick. Thank you, then. Thanks, Anne. Goodbye. Thank bye you. Bye.